Awesome job, uh, Willie. I'm sure you'll have some questions for him during our uh, Q&A uh, period. Uh, the obvious thing to most of you as you read all of the literature uh, on climate change is most people just uh, ignore the sun. I mean, the, the average person say uh, that uh, our climate has little to do with the sun, which of course is patently absurd, uh, and Willie's work shows that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Uh, our next speaker is David Legates. David is a professor of climatology at the University of Delaware, a former uh, state climatologist for the state of Delaware, and uh, his work deals with uh, all things water uh, in climate change. David? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, I must apologize first because I should have been paying attention to this long ago because when I looked at it, it was like, ah, this is obvious. But it's probably not obvious to the general public or to most scientists who don't understand how precipitation is taken. So therefore, uh, I want to look more detail at this. Um, one of the things I've learned about is point record rainfalls. And uh, when you update it to 2013, 2014, these data don't change. And I've noticed that all but two of those records were set before my was born. So the question is, if precipitation extremes are increasing, why are we not really setting extreme records? Um, but nevertheless, what I see from results in Delaware that we've talked about, Delaware is getting wetter, and particularly the Northeast in particular is seeing more intense rainfall. Um, and they tend to show two graphs. The first one is this graph, showing extreme one-day precipitation events with an increase, and I'll talk about that one in a moment. And the second one is this one that points to Northeast, and you see more than 70% increase in heavy rain events in the Northeast, whatever that really means. So I want to look closely at this, and I went back and I said, well, I found out this came, comes from something called the NOAA Climate Extremes Index, and they have a number of these, and this is step four, which is to take twice the percentage of the U.S. with a much greater than normal proportion of precipitation. I'll explain that in a moment. So it contributes to this, and this is used to be able to demonstrate that North America, that United States precipitation, United States climate in general, I should say, is becoming more extreme, uh, which fits the global warming mantra, but doesn't really fit theory. Um, so let me look closely at this data, these data. And what you usually see is it's smoothed with 11-point binomial filter, which is what that line is in there. But when you look at the data, you see it sort of takes an upturn around 1970s or so, and continues up uh, towards the end. The bottom, oops, excuse me, the bottom of the record here is uh, temperature, or excuse me, time from 1905 to 2005. And on the left is a percentage. And what that percentage is, is a percent of the United States with a greater than normal proportion of its precipitation defined from extreme one day precipitation events. And this is equivalent to the highest 10th percentile. So if we had completely random time series, we'd expect on average that one-tenth or 10 percent of the United States would be uh, in this extreme. So expected value is going to be 10 percent. And when you can see our expected value increases, we interpret that as being a climate change. But I went back and looked at that and said that when general people connect that, they often then superimpose on it the carbon dioxide signal. And you'd have to be a complete moron not to realize that that increase must somehow be directly attributable to carbon dioxide. I know correlation doesn't imply causality, but by golly, that is so strong, you can't deny it. And in particular, it has all the characteristics of anthropogenic climate change, because if you squint, you can see it. <laughs> but I go back, and I looked at that, and I said, no. That's not what's happening. There's something completely different going on, and it, it's obvious to me, but I'll show it to make it obvious to you. The first thing I want to do is plot the data from 1910 to 1992. And I have to go out to five decimal places in the R squared to actually get a number that's not zero, which is almost unheard of even from random chance points of view. But yes, that curve is as flat as possible. And then I plotted the data from 1995 to the present. And I also get an insignificant trend, but somehow there's a jump discontinuity between those two of about 6% of the planet. Now, if you understand climate, climate is not supposed to work this way. 
uh, very few things climate does a jump discontinuity. In the data record, usually when you see a jump discontinuity, it's something wrong with the data. And so the question is, that we wanted to ask, is what happened in the early 1990s that could have jaws this? And in fact, that's exactly what I thought of when I saw the curve, so I didn't bother to look at any of the algorithms that look for breakpoints and things like that, because I knew what the answer was. And clearly the answer is the National Weather Service Modernization Program and the switch to ASOS. Here's what happened. If you go before 1992, we have two, two primary networks of me measuring observations for precipitation. One is what's called the First Order Weather Station Network, which is professional meteorological observers paid by the National Weather Service. They were doing it every hour. The second is cooperative observers, and they take the observations once a day, and they're volunteers. Essentially, both groups use the same type of rain gauge, which is the old-fashioned type where you have to look inside and use a dipstick to figure out how much rain is. Well, the idea of the modernization program is we have better ways of doing this. And so we can come up with instrumentation that can provide a more accurate way of, a more reliable and quick and efficient way of measuring precipitation. So in 1995, and starting in 1992, but ending in 1995, we installed what is now ASOS, so the Automated Surface Observing System. And they were rain gauges that looked something like this. And these rain gauges are known as tipping bucket rain gauges because inside there's a little tipping mechanism and so the precipitation falls in one bucket and then when it fills it tips, it fall, fills the other bucket and it tips back and you just simply automatically count the number of tips and that tells you how much rain is falling. Um, the problem with the tipping bucket gauge is twofold and I was on an international panel that told the National Weather Service in 1990 this is going to be a fundamental problem to your network, both climatologically and for accuracy, and of course, they don't listen to us. But the idea is this is a heated tipping bucket gauge, and there's two problems with them. The second is sublimation of snow. When you start heating a tipping bucket gauge, the snow doesn't necessarily convert to precipitation or liquid and be measured like rain. It often just simply becomes gas and disappears, and so the rainfall, snowfall in that case never really happened. That's a fundamental problem. But the other one is mistip precipitation because in very high precipitation, heavy precipitation events, you get the tipping bucket just simply system can't keep up. And so we've known both of those problems. And so in the mid-2000s, we went to a new gauge design, uh, which is the all-weather precipitation something or other gauge. I can't remember the acronym, but in any event, it, National Weather Service, like all other agencies, are fraught with acronyms. But in any event, so we went to this sort of gauge. But the interesting thing about the two of them, you'll notice, is that they all both contain something called an alder windshield. Why do we use ultra wind shields? Well, the problem with rain gauge measurement is it's a function of wind speed, and the higher the wind speed, the lower the catch. So there's a bias based on that. So if we move the gauge closer to the ground, which we did early on, you're gonna get a more efficient catch. And secondly, if you put a windshield around it, you're also gonna get a more efficient catch. So we've changed the instrumentation twofold so that one, we get a more efficient catch, but they also make another adjustment. Because remember I said this tipping bucket mechanism's got a problem. So what ASOS does is automatically at the station adjust every minute precipitation using that equation, which isn't a problem really uh, until you actually look at the equation graphed. And then what you see here is down at the lower end of the spectrum, right in here, you can see this is where most of the observations that you use to fit the curve are from. Very normal, everyday sort of rainfall events. That's not much of a change. The problem is when we're talking about the extreme rainfall events, we're talking about things with very high intensity rainfalls, potentially with high wind speed. So we get a bigger wind error, but we also get a much bigger adjustment factor. And so one of the things you find is that there's the Unionville, uh, Maryland record in 1956 for scale, but if we have 0.75 or three quarters of an inch an hour, the ASOS thing will adjust that measurement by increasing it by 45%. If it's only half an inch an hour, excuse me, an hour, a minute, if it's half an inch a minute, we would increase it by 30%, and if it's 0.25 inches a minute, it increases by 15%. So while the curve has probably been fit with a lot of data down at the lower end of the spectrum, it's when we get the rare events that we're focusing on in extremes where this curve starts to become an extrapolation problem known well in statistical analysis, and I think that poses a fundamental problem. So, three reasons I've got is this over-adjustment of the tipping gauge bias, and the question is, this should have gone away when we went to the new gauge in 2005. 
It hasn't. My suspicion is since this was part of the actual on-site algorithms, they forgot to turn that off. I can't say that's true yet. I'm trekking, trying to check that out, but that's my suspicion as to why this thing didn't disappear and just simply magically continued when we went to the next gauge. But clearly the reduction in the orifice height and equipping the gauge with an orifice shield gives you a more efficient catch, which artificially inflates the time series records. So, why does this become a, a Northeast problem and not really in the Midwest? Well, remember, we've got two networks. We've got the first order weather station network, taken by, originally taken by uh, paid employees, um, and we have the not cooperative network, which are paid by volunteers. All of this modernization applies to the first, does not apply to the, apply to the second. So the second does not see this change in gauge design. Essentially, they're using the same old use a dipstick measurement to be able to figure out how much precipitation fell. And what, the, what this extremes index does, is it takes the longest, most complete station record in each one degree by one degree grid cell. And, for, and that allows for artificial, uh, even spatial coverage. The question is, where do we think the biggest, well, if we have weather, National Weather Service first order stations and the cooperative network in the same grid, it's most likely we're going to select the first order weather station network because it has the most complete record and the longest record. Because the cooperative station network, people go on vacation, they go to meetings like this, they're not there to take observations daily, so there are holes in the record. So it's likely that the first order weather stations are going to be there. So in a sense, why therefore do we see this increase in the Northeast? Where is the biggest density of airports and weather stations? In the Northeast. So that area is going to be overrepresented by first order weather stations. What's happening in the western two-thirds, or western half of the country? Well, if you read the documentation, it says the original, thing, original um, uh, index was supplemented by stations in the west using stations taken largely from the cooperative station network. What they did was they recognized very few one degree by one degree boxes were being filled out in the west, so they just went and got additional stations from the cooperative network to make fill it out. So there's more cooperative network stations in the west they tend to water out the ASOS effect, and that's why you don't see a dramatic increase in the West, but you do see it tremendously in the East. Now, how do I know I might be right? Here's your cross-validation. If we're seeing heavier precipitation events, it's got to show up in the stream flow. That is, that water has got to go somewhere. So if extreme precipitation is increasing, we would expect to find increases in um, we would expect to find increases in maximum stream flow per year. Do we see that? If we don't, it argues it's an artifact of the data. If we do, it's an artifact, it argues that it is a climate change signal. Here's an older study by Linz and Slack, both from uh, USGS Trends. They concluded, in this case, looking at non-urbanized, non-channelized basins, so you don't have land use change effects. They included that trends are least prevalent in the annual maximum category. Here's a more recent study by Hirsch and Ryberg, also at USGS. Has the magnitudes of floods across the USA changed with global carbon dioxide? In this case, I'm not necessarily interested in the carbon dioxide link, but has it changed over time, which is essentially the same question. They look at, in this case, annual floods, which we're looking at the annual maximum flood. They look at stream gauges that have limited or no changes in the uh, I can't read it this far, little or no uh, changes in these, the situation. And their conclusion is that based upon the four areas that they, look, they examined, none of the four show a significant increase in maximum precipitation, in the precipitation annual floods. Here's another one. Unfortunately, all these are USGS. Maybe USGS could use some more funding. I don't know. But in any event, here's a percent of stream gauges above landfall, land, uh, bankful, I should say. Bankful is described by essentially the 2.3 year um, return period. And again, you see no change in extreme bankful precipitation. And one last one you see, this is from a friend of mine, Greg McCabe and Dave Wallach, also of USGS. Uh, the theme here, I guess, uh, looking at patterns and stream flow characteristics uh, just last year, and they concluded with respect to the maximum annual flows that most stations east of the Rockies exhibit no long-term monotonic trends. They said there was simply a, an increase that they saw in about 1970, but in 2000 it went back to the way it used to be. So it's clearly not an increase associated with rising precipitation, but 
essentially it's something else, and yeah, something else I think is my conclusion, oops, I'm not supposed to go that far, is my conclusion, which is that what we're seeing is not a change in maximum precipitation, but rather what we're seeing is it's an artifact of the National Weather Service modernization program and the gauge change that came along with it. The next step we want to look at, particularly with um, Greg McCabe and I are looking at, is number five, which is another precipitation problem. This is greater than normal days of precipitation plus the U.S. with much greater than normal days without precipitation. We've already published a paper that documents that there's a fundamental difference between the first order network, which is much better at that point, than the cooperative network, which isn't and we want to do some further analysis with the rest of the country. My suspicion, though, the Climate Extremes Index has got significant problems with both 0.4 and 0.5, and that makes it difficult to continue to argue that the climate of the U.S., at least, is becoming more extreme. I thank you very much.